Have you ever looked in the mirror and thought, wow, I'm really inside of this thing. This is me. Something that stands out to me about these experiences is how immediate my own body feels. Suddenly my skin is there, wrapped around me like a cage, impossible to ignore. But how are we to understand these experiences? Mirrors have been featured in the ideas of certain philosophers in a way that may surprise you. I'd argue that this uncanny experience is actually a fantastic reason to explore some of those ideas about the body and how the conscious mind experiences it. The French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan I think provides the most comprehensive look at how we can understand the disconnect we sometimes feel with our bodies. His idea of the mirror stage as an essential part of every child's development is one of the most profound approaches towards the body that I've ever come across. I think about it a lot. The mirror stage takes place when a child discovers their reflection, resulting in two significant outcomes. First, the child learns what they look like. They associate themselves with their body, the complete image of which is provided to them by their reflection. It's commonly thought that three-month-old babies don't understand that all of their body parts belong to them. In other words, their body is fragmented, which makes their image in the mirror something altogether different from their actual body and its sensations and urges. From now on, the child will always associate themselves with this image. It becomes an ideal representation of who they are, their selfhood. It also makes their body feel as if it's something they possess, instead of the literal basis for their existence. Direct experience with one's body is always barred, compromised by the social fantasies ingrained into language itself. What we call the body is itself a construct of the mind. It is an abstraction, far removed from biology, meant instead to signify such an image. Second, the child develops a social identity based on their image. According to the existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, the look of another person turns you into an object. At that moment, you embody whatever others perceive you as. We also see this in Lacan's mirror stage. In the mirror, we come to understand ourselves as others see us. We develop an I or self to which we can refer back to. When I look into a mirror, I assume this is what I look like for other people. So unless seriously challenged, the image we have of ourselves is constructed in answer to the question, what am I to others? The mirror reflects back onto us our own gaze, which is already the gaze of other people, thereby turning us into an object for ourselves to examine. I see myself because others see me. Lacan's perspective subverts the popular views of other philosophers who posited either an unrelatedness or unity between body and mind. Descartes, whom you might remember for his phrase, I think, therefore I am, is also known for a philosophy of mind called Cartesian dualism, which served as a dominant philosophical perspective for centuries. Its thesis was that the mind and body are unrelated and separate, so mental activity can continue to prevail without the body. The phenomenologist philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty rejected this dualism altogether, claiming that the two act in tandem. Your mind is shaped through your embodied engagement with your environment. Lacan differs on this point in that he proposes a negative relationship, arguing that though the mental and physical are related, there's a fundamental conflict or tension between the two. Only a consciousness that sees itself as incompatible with the limitations of its body can see the body itself as a limitation. The mirror stage encapsulates this drama between physiology and identity. There is always an irreconcilable gap between the ideal image of the self and the reality of one's corporeal form. All of us feel it in different magnitudes. Understanding that tension can help us to empathize with transgender folks and the sentiments of those with eating disorders or body dysmorphia. But let's return to that unsettling experience with the mirror, when the image you've built for yourself disintegrates. The horror of the body is the realization that you are your body, that your body isn't something you simply possess. It's especially moving to look at x-rays of your own body or brain, just like it is to look at the dissected bodies of others. This is what you look like without skin, and bones and muscle. This is you. 
you and everyone else. It's either a miracle or the cruelest joke. But sometimes it doesn't take all of that. Sometimes all you need to experience this is a look in the mirror. An encounter with the immediacy of your body is as much an existential crisis as a near-death experience can be. Body horror in general is very real, not just a mere genre of literature and film. Fictional, but nonetheless intense violations of the human body can fill us with dread, twist your stomach, or make your skin crawl. But they exist only as extreme versions of the real thing. Engaging with body horror media can make you feel very present in your body through these sensations. The horror of the body is a case of insides falling out. One of the observations Martin Heidegger makes in his famous philosophical work, Being and Time, concerns the way we approach tools in our everyday lives. His writing uses the example of a hammer. When we use a hammer, it adjusts to our senses almost as if it were an extension of our body. We become engaged in hammering, and so its material makeup goes unnoticed. But if the handle cracks, or the head flies off, it's just there. A hammer only comes to our senses as an object, a thing, when it stops working. Similarly, the body often feels like an extension to our will, an instrument used to perform tasks initiated by our conscious mind. As such, the immediacy of our body, its existence as a fleshy material thing, is forgotten until, for example, we injure ourselves. If you break your arm, you can no longer use it the same way you did before, and so it feels like a foreign object attached to you, something you are always aware of because of the pain you feel if you aren't careful with it. If you sprain your ankle, you'll be constantly aware of it as you limp on that foot, and if you have a cough, you'll likely pay more attention to your labored breathing. What connects us to our body in these examples is pain. Pain is a reminder of our material status as human beings, it reminds me that I am my body, not an invincible consciousness that simply possesses a body. Pain is a necessary item to consider going forward. It's perhaps the fundamental way we are confronted by our bodies. Illness and extension of this. But there's another way we can find ourselves in our bodies, and it also includes pain, when pleasure itself becomes painful. One of the core elements of the body horror genre is that one's own body lies outside of their control. This is horrifying in part because it has a strong basis in reality. Bodily or psychological urges seemingly outside of our control are an uncomfortable part of the body's influence on the psyche. As someone with ADHD, this is something I've thought about and experienced my entire life. But for Lacan, such urges are one of the core ways we plunge directly back into our bodies. The Lacanian concept of jouissance is basically a pleasure in pain, a disturbing kind of pleasure that is felt only in so much as the pleasure itself is painful. Lacan calls this true enjoyment. Now, it sounds masochistic, sinister even, and to an extent it is, but I think looking at it like this would be coloring it a shade too unusual, too niche. This kind of thing is actually quite common. Jouissance is the pleasure of compulsion, it is the kind of pleasure that overwhelms, that disturbs. Because of its excessive and uncontrollable nature, at times it has even been called traumatic. As Lacan has it, jouissance pits you in a direct confrontation with your body. It's synonymous with the essence of being itself. He connects it to the bodily urges I referenced earlier. If you've ever been so absorbed in playing a game that you stayed up so late into the night, that the sun began to rise as your retinas burned from the strain imposed on you by your monitor and your body begged to go to sleep and you continued on anyway because you were unable to stop yourself, then you know something about jouissance. There are so many different hues and shades to this concept, so many different ways you could interpret it. It could simply be a case of indulging in something you know is bad for you, a guilty pleasure. It is, after all, the body that craves things that aren't good for it. 
or it could mean pleasure so fantastic it harms you to feel it. The ambiguity of the term is what makes it so difficult. But as long as you feel pleasure in pain, or pain in pleasure, that's jouissance. I can't think of a better exploration of jouissance and its relation to body horror than the anime Akira. The 1988 movie depicts a city defined at every level of its society by power, from the inner government to rival street gangs. After a nuclear explosion involving a powerful psychic named Akira leveled Tokyo, it was rebuilt into a sprawling metropolis. But even in Neo-Tokyo, the nuclear ghost of Akira is omnipresent as a collective trauma. The city never truly recovered. Its desperate grasp for power is a constant coping mechanism. But as Lacan himself emphasizes, the person who always needs to be in power is themselves the most powerless. The movie itself follows Kaneda and Tetsuo, two lifelong friends in a biker gang. After Tetsuo has an encounter with a psychic child on the run near the site of the original explosion, his own powers awaken. As a result of this, he's captured and experimented on by the government. During this time, his powers continue to develop, but not without debilitating headaches and disturbing visions of his entrails spilling out and Neo Tokyo crumbling into dust. Kaneda attempts to rescue Tetsuo, but there's no need. Tetsuo's powers allow him to escape, but he grows into a brutal megalomaniac, killing anyone who stands in his way or looks down on him. When Kaneda finally reaches him, Tetsuo despises him for trying to save him. Tetsuo then sets out on a hunt for Akira to further increase his powers, while Kaneda rushes to stop him from triggering another explosion. After a series of exhilarating fight scenes, Tetsuo finally finds Akira, or what's left of him. But just when Tetsuo seems unstoppable, Kaneda confronts him. But their fight is cut short by a sudden beam of light from space that surrounds Tetsuo and blasts him with energy, severing his arm. Using his powers, he grows another one, merging his flesh with metal scraps, but it proves unstable. Tetsuo finally loses control of his powers and his body begins to mutate and grow wildly beyond his control. His skin bursts like a popped balloon while his gooey insides swell and expand like elephant toothpaste. If you're anything like me, you felt genuinely excited at the reveal of Tetsuo's powers. Spectacular scenes like this one in which he first escapes or watching him destroy the orbital laser himself and exclaiming out loud, whoa, what? He can even survive in space? feels exciting. But that just makes this perverse transformation all the more uncomfortable. We felt the thrill of Tetsuo's powers, the shameless bombast, and celebrated within ourselves. But now we feel his pain too. Lacan often referred to jouissance as an excess of life. When Tetsuo's insides fall out, it's because there's an excess of them. They burst forth from inside of him. His ordinary body is unable to contain them any longer. This isn't only representative of the way that Tetsuo's body is unable to contain his powers, the way they've caught up to him, it also mirrors the way Lacan viewed jouissance. You are only able to reach such a state when you're in pain as a result of your enjoyment being pushed to such an extreme that pain has become unavoidable. It is enjoyment in the most extreme sense, when your body itself can no longer sustain the kind of pleasure it's feeling, when you've lost control of your own enjoyment. Lacan couples jouissance with the bodily fragmentation that precedes the mirror stage, the kind of discombobulated living where your body feels divided against itself. This feeling of confusion with one own's body is why the grotesque transformations in Akira and other works resonate with so many of us. But Akira isn't just a metaphor for jouissance. It's the entire basis of its plot. It imagines a world in which our fetish for the most extreme forms of enjoyment will lead to an inevitable catastrophic end. Fear the old blood. In FromSoft's Bloodborne, you hunt down supernatural monstrosities in a gothic city across the sea in order to lift the permanent veil of darkness which plagues the sky. You are a hunter, set out to end the repeating nightmare of the hunt. Despite this simple premise, Bloodborne is a game with a unique perspective on body horror, concerned with that which is distinctly feminine. 
Amidst combat with a legion of bloodthirsty beasts, Bloodborne's relentless examination of pregnancy, menstruation, and, of course, blood, tells a story of insides falling out. The city of Yarnum is obsessed with blood. Its ruling body, the Healing Church, administers its uniquely potent variant to the sick, promising miraculous strength and vitality until things go horribly wrong and they're corrupted into beasts. No ordinary man or woman can fight the beasts alone, however. Every hunter fights fire with fire, using the healing blood themselves. So at the beginning of your hunt, you find yourself strapped to a gurney and injected with some of the stuff, partially embracing the beast within. You always keep some with you, too. Blood is an invaluable resource. Time and time again, you'll inject it into your thigh when your health runs too low. Even when you see others falter, even when threatened with madness yourself, you push forward. I can already smell the pungent metallic sourness of blood, the warmth of it all that defines the hunt. In the wake of your slaughter, you paint your cloak red, the streets red, and then the sky red. The sun sets and the night grows even more oppressive as grander beings emerge from out of the sky. The trouble with the Yarnum's Beast Plague lies with where the blood of the Healing Church actually comes from. The source is precisely these Great Ones, ruthlessly dissected in the pursuit of Eldritch Truth. The Old Blood is itself a form of jubissance. It starts off as a healing power and erupts into an excess of wet viscera, an excess of life. The material horror of the flesh can be found in the very blood of Yarnum itself. The objective of the Great Ones is unknown, but what we see in the game is their forceful impregnation of human women. One woman, a prostitute named Ariana that you can save from off the streets of the Cathedral Ward, will give birth to a Great One after you trigger the descent of the Blood Moon. A trail of blood leads from her chair down into the privacy of a sewer. The newborn eldritch worm chirps at its mother, begging to be embraced, while she screams out in ungodly despair. The ghost of Queen Yarnum, when you see her, has blood trailing down her white gown and her hands shackled in chains. She too was forcefully impregnated with a great one long ago, a child named Murgo. That baby died inside of her as a calcified fetus, alive now only in a dream. Although the queen is dead too, her restless consciousness continues to stir beyond her death, linked to Murgo as she is. The Great Ones confront women with their womb. Some even seek to win the favor of the Great Ones by drinking the blood of others so that perhaps they can bear one of their children. Like the Xenomorph in Alien, it's as if the Great Ones represent life itself, the horrors of nature and biology. They are only discernible motivations to survive and reproduce. It's fitting, then, that their blood is a source of jouissance for all of Yarnum. They're just one way that, as fellow YouTuber Honeybat says in her video, Bloodborne is viscerally feminine. But there are others, too. Every woman in the game who's still young enough to menstruate will offer you her blood. If you choose to get yours from Ariana the prostitute instead of a nun whose whole existence is defined by her ability to provide the stuff, that nun will eventually murder Ariana out of jealousy. Swapping bodily fluids like this clearly has some sexual undertone, albeit in a way that feels foreign to the act of sex itself. Bloodborne is morbidly fascinated with reproductive biology. The biological aspects of sex, devoid of any titillating eroticism, can be alien and disturbing in their own right. The secrets of the mechanisms of conception are something most of us seem to prefer to think very little about. Gustave Courbat's painting L'Origine du Monde, or The Origin of the World, has been a sore point of scandal since its conception. It went contrary to the attitude of its time when nudity was tolerated within the context of mythological or other fantastical scenes, but was never captured in its profane reality. Courba pioneered realism in art. As a further rejection of the delicately smooth and obviously idealized nudes painted by his colleagues, he would attack his canvases with the stress of thick slabs of paint, producing gritty, broken textures in his artwork. There is something at least a little shocking about it, though the piece was never meant to arouse. 
I think what's heinous about it is precisely that it isn't erotic. Nudity in a doctor's office means something different than nudity in the bedroom. More than any myth or dream, the origins of existence, the gateway permitting entry into our world, is this, the genitals and womb of a woman. This is the inescapable foundation of your flesh. Elizabeth Gross, in her book, mentions the misogynistic assumption we sometimes make that women are more of a body than men. Women seem to take on the role of being a body for both sexes. We're so horrified by the body, so seemingly ashamed to have entered this world at all, that the origin of this existence, the uterus, is especially reviled. Bloodborne is a macabre mixture of sex and illness, and more than just a few of the distressing designs for the game's monsters share the wrongness of having the inside on the outside. It's a further articulation of the body whore concept of one's insides falling out. One of the scenes that inspired genuine despair in me was finding Queen Annalise of the Vile Bloods pulverized beyond recognition into red mist. Her meaty entrails stick to the walls, drip down her chair. Alfred, the Vile Blood Hunter, stands over her. There, you filthy monstrosity! What good's your immortality now? Try stirring up trouble in this sorry state, all mangled and twisted with every inside on the outside for all the world to see! <laughs> But the queen is still alive. You can collect a tissue sample from her throne and feel its enigmatic pulse. With her inside on the outside, her immortality has kept her alive. But in what state? My mind keeps returning to this scene when I contemplate the visceral femininity of the game. The shame and even horror of having one's insides on the outside for all the world to see appears to be the highest form of humiliation. Likewise, countless women have felt ashamed of their periods. It is, after all, a stain on propriety and one's social identity in a world of men, a reminder that you are a body. The philosopher Simone de Beauvoir writes in her book, The Second Sex, that it is during her periods that a woman feels her body most painfully as an obscure, alien thing. It is, indeed, the prey of a stubborn and foreign life that each month constructs and then tears down a cradle within it. Each month, all things are made ready for a child and then aborted in the crimson flow. Woman, like man, is her body, but her body is something other than herself. There's a thread running between Lacan and de Beauvoir, namely the sense that there are forces within you operating as something other than yourself. You are not entirely in command of your own physicality, de Beauvoir thought that the social identity of a woman is shaped by the tension between their womb and their social aspirations. Just like Lacan believed, the tension between the body and its image gives birth to the actuality of one's identity. Her writing beautifully blurs into Lacan, an almost perfect mere image. You'd be remiss to interpret the visceral femininity of Bloodborne as its way of pushing the point that women's bodies are gross. Even at its grossest and goriest, it tries to communicate the gloom and despair of its characters and world more than it intends to gross you out. Instead, the game feels like a recognition of the reproductive demands and social and bodily horrors women experience, in the very way women experience them. The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann is my favorite novel of all time. Its description alone was already enough to inspire a perfect mixture of dread and fascination in me. A young man by the name of Hans Castor visits his cousin in a tuberculosis clinic in the Swiss Alps for three weeks, contracts tuberculosis himself during his stay, and then spends the next seven years there on the mountaintop. Although it is a novel where nothing really happens when looking in from outside, Examining the inner lives of the sanitarium patients reveals profound philosophies inspired by an ironically lively series of events. Reflections and viscera alike, the Magic Mountain is about the inside falling out. In more ways than one, everyone understands each other by their insides instead of merely their outward appearance. 
it is a novel that pulses with life in the face of death. Not to mention that it's genuinely one of the funniest books I've ever read. It too has something to say about sexuality and illness. The progression of Hans's sickness is accompanied by his infatuation for a certain ill-mannered woman by the name of Claudia Chocha. She slams the door every day at mealtimes before slinking to her seat, much to his annoyance. Rumors circulate around her that she's in an open marriage. She's something of an extreme hedonist. Yet surprising even himself, her depravity and worm-ridden chest attract him. Claudia is the novel's unashamed embodiment of pure passion, of jouissance. Words remain unspoken between them, yet they share a special bond through other symbolic gestures. The embarrassing closure of a curtain across the dining room, conveniently sitting behind her at a lecture, and the meeting of eyes at inopportune moments. As his fever emerges, he has the fleeting impression that it's to impress her. Perhaps, as the sanitarium's psychologist suggests, love is a cause of illness. Or maybe the urgency and lucidity of disease is what enables the patient's deepest affections. Once Hans has his anticipated conversation and speaks with Claudia in intoxicatingly lyrical French on the night of Carnival, she leaves him the x-ray of her lungs and departs from the sanitarium the next day. In her history of medical imaging, Naked to the Bone, Brett Ian Cleves describes how the invention of the x-ray shook Victorian society by undermining its ideas about bodily privacy. To see directly into another person, or even yourself, was downright embarrassing. The x-ray altered the self-perception of an entire culture. Claudia's gesture renders her more naked than naked. It's a suggestive act that has the same significance as the gifting of one's blood in Bloodborne. For man, Eros and Thanatos, love and death, desire and decay, all reflect something of the other. Disease might be a hindrance to one's sexual desire, but if anything, for that exact reason, it's a test of true love. The physicality of others can be horrifying in its own way, but love is a radical acceptance of this physicality, in every possible color of jouissance and mortal finitude. Certainly, love can never be disembodied, Love is our sympathy with organic life, man writes, the touchingly lustful embrace of what is destined to decay. The Magic Mountain is an aggressively dialectical novel. Its characters and themes exist not in isolation, but in an environment of constant confrontation with their opposites. The tension between mind and body is also a dialectical issue, a fact highlighted by the plot of the novel. Once Hans Kastorp has been shown the x-ray of the moist spot in his lungs and is officially declared a patient of the Burkhoff, he goes from a young engineer with plans for his life to an invalid, happily lost in time's meandering flow. The smallest unit of time atop the mountain is a month. Reality blurs between the snow flurries. Illness is a duty, he decides. Essentially, one's role as a patient is to recover from one's ailments. But disease can grant a certain freedom and genius to those that it afflicts. Illness gives the gifts of boredom and existential focus. Having nothing to do but rest gives you plenty of time to think. By falling ill, Hans sheds his aspirations and place in society in exchange for an identity defined entirely by the illness of his body. The irony of this reduction, its dialectical twist, is that by adopting the role of a patient, he becomes entirely free, as he never could have been in the Flatlands, to explore the lifestyles and philosophies of the other Burghoff residents. Precisely by being reduced to his body, does he attain the freedom necessary to expand his mind. His very sickness becomes the catalyst for his self-discovery and enlightenment. However, while it leads to Hans's intellectual growth, for other characters, it becomes the basis for irrational thinking, delusions, and a disconnect from reality. Bloodborne's lore primarily centers around the efforts of scholars to ascend humanity to the being of the Great Ones. Research into this possibility began at Bergenworth, under the instruction of Provost Willem, but a schism with one of his students eventually led to the formation of the Healing Church. Willem believed that the old blood was something they should be afraid of, and that they should try to ascend by elevating their inner sight above the banality of the body. 
at Bergenworth, Willem had an epiphany. We are thinking on the basis of planes. What we need are more eyes. Lawrence disagreed with Willem and saw potential benefits in blood ministration that he thought outweighed the rumored dangers. Ultimately, Lawrence would disregard the need for eyes on the inside. Bergenworth was abandoned by the church and declared unholy ground. The conflicting perspectives of Willem and Lawrence contain the elements for a debate on how to approach the problem of embodiment. While Willem's approach was to escape the physical body through reason and a developed mind, Lawrence contested that the depravity of the body isn't only something we shouldn't be afraid of, it's something that should be welcomed, embraced. It's as much a case of mind versus body as you can get. Both perspectives have their flaws, of course. When you find Willem at Bergenworth, his body is so frail from his rejection of it, he's unable to speak. All he can do is sway in his rocking chair and motion towards the moon's reflection on the lake, where Rom, the once woman, now vacuous spider, holds back the pale blood sky and its nightmarish inhabitants. And Lawrence, well, he's the man responsible for the beast plague. Like the rest of Yarnum, he too has transformed into a beast his mangy fur burning with an internal flame. Maybe you'd like to acquire some eldritch knowledge about the cosmos, in which case I recommend Brilliant.org, who graciously funded the research for this video. Brilliant is one of the most entertaining ways to learn math and science that I know. Everything about them is interactive. Their lessons, covering everything from algebra to statistics and logic, behave like mini-games, respecting both your time and your attention. If you like the idea of daily refreshers on STEM topics, or just like the sound of hands-on learning with math, then check it out. You can get all of the fun of learning without the horrifying side effects of lining your brain with eyes. If Brilliant sounds like it's for you, then you can check out everything it has to offer for free for a full 30 days by visiting brilliant.org slash Clark Eliason, or just click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. When I first watched Cowboy Bebop, I ran through all 26 episodes in one day. I started early in the morning and I finished before dinner time. The show is nearly uncategorizable. But there was one episode in particular that made me stop for a minute. An episode that so completely threw me off my game, killed the momentum I had bouncing from one episode to the next, that I've really never forgotten it. Episode 23 of Cowboy Bebop, Brain Scratch, shows us a Martian cult that believes it's the destiny of humankind to shed their bodies and exist as pure consciousness on the internet, to lose themselves amidst the infinite sea of electrons. They use a device that captures their brain waves and converts them into code the device uploads to the internet, allowing them to live without a body forever, but killing them in the process. Very clearly, the episode drew its inspiration from the real-life suicide cult of Heaven's Gate. A bounty has been placed on the cult's leader, so the Bebop's bounty hunting crew tries to track him down. Except there's absolutely no history of Dr. Londes ever existing. Only after the gang reverse hacks the program the cult uses to migrate their souls do they uncover the truth. Dr. Londes is in fact a fabrication, a myth born from the mind of a paralyzed 15-year-old boy genius on life support, plugged directly into the internet from his bed. A boy for whom the only possible meaning of life could be to dream the greatest dream. I guess all he could do was dream, so the dreams turned dark. Meanwhile, Spike confronts Londes in a remote building on Mars' surface. Watching the tower of television screens flicker on still unnerves me. Their showdown isn't the usual gunfight or karate beatdown we've come to expect from the rest of the show. Instead of throwing punches, the two throw around ideas. You're like a kid with a toy. What? What makes you think that you know anything about me? But as half of the Bebop crew stands over the living corpse of Londis' creator back at the hospital and begins the process of disconnecting him permanently from the network, Londis cries out in his true terror, begs and pleads not to be shut off. And then the graphics begin to die. Everyone should have 
the same body as I have. The scene is horrible to watch. I don't even know how to describe the feeling it gives me. The screens fill with impenetrable code before silence falls like a guillotine, and a somber error signals the end. Then, they shackle this comatose, bedridden boy to his hospice bed, an act of redundancy more poetic than necessary. Already he's trapped inside his body, a prison more hopeless and claustrophobic than any cell. And then they leave him there. When I think about the pursuit of esoteric knowledge in Bloodborne, the pursuit of actually thinking your way to godhood, more than anything, I think about this episode. That way of viewing the body is identical to the views of various groups in the game. In particular, the scholars of Mensis have taken the implications of insight to their extreme. These scholars are distinguished by the cages they wear on their heads. The description for the cage explains that it restrains the will of the self, allowing for those that wear it to see the profane world for what it is. However, its use is twofold, as it also functions as an antenna to facilitate contact with the Great Ones. Much like Scratch, the scholars of Mensis are obsessed with the prospect of ascending beyond the body and dreaming the greatest dream. The Great Ones exist on multiple levels of existence, and think on multiple planes of thought, more than anything, the scholars of Mensis want to think like they do. Using the umbilical cord of Murgo, they conducted a ritual to this end that transported their consciousnesses into a nightmare. All that remains of them in the waking world are their skeletons, meticulously stripped clean of all flesh. Their attempts to ascend led to a mass suicide. This umbilical cord granted Mensis audience with Murgo, but resulted in the stillbirth of their brains. Interestingly, when you kill their leader Mikolash in the nightmare, his cries somewhat mimic those of Londes. I am a big believer in the paradox of existentialism, that the despair we feel from our existence can itself be the main inspiration for an untouchable happiness. Paraphrasing man's own words about his novel, in the Magic Mountain, Hans Kastorp comes to conclude, quite in line with his progression as a character, that one must make the existential encounter with sickness and death in the body in order to end up healthier and more sane than before, to love deeper. But we've never really made that encounter if all we've ever done is try to escape it. He who knows the body, who knows life, also knows death, Hans declares in the most magical of the book's chapters, you have to hold it up to the other half, to its opposite. Because our interest in death and illness is nothing but a way of expressing an interest in life. The novel ends with the bleak bullet rain and trench thunder of World War I. Hans is sent to the front lines and the sanitarium closes. There can be no further healing in a world suddenly bent on its irrational end. But as we visit him for the last time, and watch him splay himself in the muck while bombs blast in front of him, we find him singing of love. Unlike Londis, and unlike Mikolesh, faced with what is more than likely his own death, Hans keeps courage with his resounding yes to life in the body. Out of this worldwide festival of death, this ugly, rutting fever that inflames the rainy evening sky all round, will love someday rise up out of this too? If it hasn't yet become the prerogative of others to welcome the body and its insight, then perhaps the responsibility has fallen to you and I. The next time you feel a twinge of disgust at fiction or reality, listen to the song of life it sings and feel what it's like to be alive. <laughs>